As I said, this is part five in the doctrine of Christian learning. And uh, we're in the book of Ephesians chapter two. Now we're going to have just um, some review beforehand. And then from uh, that point, we're going to move on into some new material. Now, we learned that the Lord Jesus Christ was the third federal head of a race of people. And as such, he was totally different from the other two that um, were federal heads, Lucifer and Adam. When they were created, they had both a perfect environment and then a good environment, but Christ had a bad one. Uh, Their environment was not cursed. Uh, The environment of Christ was. But what made things worse is that Lucifer had no tempters, Adam had one tempter, but Christ had many tempters. In fact, every single person, including his parents, uh, could prove to be a potential um, distraction to God's will for his life. Now, when Jesus Christ uh, grew up again, he was different than that of the other two federal heads. They had uh, a perfect creation in that they also had a given measure of cosmic knowledge and creature genius that was already developed. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he had no cosmic knowledge and he had to develop his full potential as a creature. And remember, that's what he became. The three doctrines that we learned, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, the doctrine of kenosis, and the doctrine of impeccability guarantee that Jesus Christ was fully a man and that face life like you and I have to face life. So he gives us the precedent, the example of what God really wants for our lives. Now, the other two, Adam and Lucifer, did not wish to Uh, remain faithful to doctrine, which is spiritual maturity. But the Lord Jesus Christ acquired a full measure of spiritual maturity, and he, uh, as we saw, uh, is our example of one who went all the way to the top. As a creature, he fully developed his spiritual capacity. We saw that Jesus Christ had a body with no sin nature, had a soul that never committed any mental attitude sins, and had a human spirit that was fully developed with Bible doctrine. Jesus Christ, like no other creature, and it's strange to speak of him as such, like no other creature, uh, was the friend of God. Now, Abraham was the friend of God, Moses, Paul, Job was the friend of God, and others, but uh, no one had as much doctrine as Jesus Christ. We saw that he had a body, a soul, and a human spirit. Now, to show you that the most important thing to Jesus Christ and God the Father was his human spirit, which contained this doctrine, we looked the last time, and this is by way of review, at the tripartite split at his death. When Jesus Christ died, three things happened. Number one, his human body went to the grave. And that is easy to prove in Scripture. Uh, This is the same body, though it did not see corruption, that lay in the tomb for three days and three nights. His HS1, or human spirit, went to Hades. And we saw that from the book of Ephesians, where... Before he ascended, he went down to the lower parts of the earth. Well, his body didn't do that. What part did? It was his soul. Jesus Christ went down there to Abraham's bosom, and uh, he was gathering the people there for an evacuation. The uh, paradise in the lower part of the earth is totally evacuated uh, today. Jesus Christ took all those souls to the third heaven. And also he made a glorious proclamation to the fallen angels there and also to the souls that were in torments, the other side of Hades. He simply said, it is finished. Fellas, your doom is sealed. But he said to the Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And we noted from the book of Psalms that the last part of that verse says, 
O God of truth or doctrine. Uh, I give you back the deposit that you've given me. You see, Jesus Christ had an accomplishment that was the greatest thing that he ever did. He remained sinless or perfect. How did he do that? He did it by constantly learning the word of God and living in the light of it. That's his greatest accomplishment. The fact that there wasn't anyone or anything that could distract him from the plan of God. And that's why we uh, uh, constantly maintain that it didn't matter what others would do. It didn't matter what others would say. Well, come on, Jesus, we're going we're gonna to take off fishing. And the Lord said, no, sorry, fellas, fishing is good, and we do that every so often, but I don't do it when it's time to learn doctrine. And, uh, and Jesus Christ devoted daily a time when he would learn more doctrine, the doctrine that was taught him week by week uh, incrementally. And uh, we saw how he actually wrote it down and he would learn it. It was on his hand, it was on his uh, left arm and it was on his forehead. So having a maximum amount of doctrine and having that doctrine keep you sinless is actually your goal for the Christian life. Oh, my goal is to do this, that, and the other. No, it's not. Your goal is to become the friend of God. And that means sometimes that you uh, have to uh, not have as many social obligations and social opportunities. Uh, today, we've got it backwards. Churches, churches want social time so that you can develop friendships with one another. And half the time, it's simply one old sin nature stroking another because they don't know doctrine. It's just simply a social club, a club, a country club type deal in a religious setting. Uh, people gather together and you ask God to bless the fellowship. Well, there is such a thing as blessed fellowship in a local church, and we're going to see exactly what it is uh, before this series is over. But it doesn't matter what others may do. Social life is important, and we need to have friends. We need to talk uh, to our friends. We need to pray for our friends. We need to support them where we can and however we can. But when it comes time to maintain your friendship with God, that must be first. And the cross proves it. Jesus Christ could have come down from the cross and... Uh, <laughs> He, he might have had some friends. Uh, yeah, I'll come down from the cross and everybody would have believed. No, that wasn't it. He thought that maintaining sinlessness was more important than having the approval of people or friends. So now you understand where your life must head. Oh yeah, you're going to get criticized from family and friends if you don't do everything that they do. And believe you me, uh, every, every weekend in the summer, uh, will we'll provide a distraction uh, by, by some people. They don't come to church. I'm not saying that you don't go and have some good times. You don't have to be in church every Sunday during the summer. I always have to explain that because people always run to, well, what's that pastor saying? We can't have a vacation. No, but I am saying that if you let family and friends pull you away from doctrine every Sunday, every Sunday, you fail. Oh, you might have a good, good family ties and strong friendships, but you can't be the friend of God. You've got to put in the time. And Jesus Christ and the cross proves that. All right. Now, uh, we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ went all the way to spiritual maturity in 30 years. Now, that's the ideal. What happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? We saw that at age three, he was called. Now, he wasn't called to salvation, but he was called of God. We call that God consciousness. The beginnings, the early stages of the wooing of the Spirit. Around age three, this happens, and uh, we investigated that. He became fully accountable for his actions when he said at age 12, No, you're not. I must be about my father's business. Oh, that's pretty... That's a pretty neat thing, isn't it, for a 12-year-old to say, I'm fully committed to God the Father. I'm not going to do I don't. I don't care what anybody else does. Oh, I know, but the gang's over here, and this group's over here, yeah. And I sometimes go over there and talk with them, and we have a good time together. But when it comes time, I'm dedicated to the Father's will. He was fully accountable 
for completing the Father's will for his life. Then at age 30, he came to the point of testing. All right? Now, we're just going to use this as, um, as an ideal example for us. Around age three, we start becoming called. See, we, have, we had a question uh, that does, do young people get influenced by others uh, so much so that when, when they, they hear the call, um, others distract them? Yes, that's true. But is there an excuse for their distraction? No. Common grace dictates that every person is made fully aware and fully accountable, so much so, Romans chapter 1, they are without excuse. Oh, I know that there's a, there's a group of, of people over here that they keep pulling this direction. So young people forget the call of God and are influenced over here. But does that give them an excuse? It does not. God the Holy Spirit, as we will see, grabs a hold of their, uh, of their inner man and forces them to see their condition before God. Now, that's common grace. You had it and I had it. You weren't saved without it. And it began around age three. You began to be accountable at age 12. You may have resisted and not gotten saved till age 42, say. But uh, regardless, this is generally uh, the point of, of I mean, the, um, the, the pattern uh, coming to the point of what I call testing. Jesus Christ was tested as to whether or not he would remain faithful to God. You and I become tested as to whether or not we will believe and remain faithful to God. Now that's the objective in the Christian way of life, to hear the word, believe it, and remain faithful. Now there are two words that we need to, to see and understand regarding this pattern. We'll call it that this pattern indicates two things, something of a crisis and something of progress, all right? At age three, you begin to be drawn to God by the Holy Spirit. At that point, you realize, now that's a crisis. Now you're too, uh, <laughs> too young to fully understand the implications, you're just simply drawn. But as you get older, the Holy Spirit comes and there is another crisis. But every single crisis that you have, that crisis is a time when the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of you and makes you understand you're a sinner and need a Savior. Makes you understand there's a God out there you're accountable to. Those things accrue and so it becomes progressive. You have a little more enlightenment. You know what this is. You know what's happening. So that by the time you reach age 12 now, you, now and again, this is, this is give or take, uh, by the time you reach age 12, you become aware that you need a Savior. And we're going to go all the way to age 30. Uh, it's, uh, this is just um, uh, simply a number we're getting from Scripture. By the time you get to age 30, there are some things that happen. If, if you are told by the Holy Spirit you need a Savior and you keep rejecting, you start hardening your heart so that that begins to accumulate now too. And every time you harden your heart, you put scar tissue on your, on your inner man. And if you eventually pull scar tissue or grow scar tissue all the way across the inner eye, God the Holy Spirit cannot get through to you and you're like Pharaoh. You're totally hardened, you're alive physically, but you can never be saved spiritually. You have totally hardened your heart against God. Now, uh, the ideal is this. As soon as you come to the crisis where you are fully accountable and responsible, God the Holy Spirit makes sure progressively that you have had enough understanding to know the full implications of the cross in your condition. So the crisis becomes, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Now, actually, he is the one who guarantees this. This is called common grace. Now, the crisis is, will you believe or won't you? If you say to the Holy Spirit, I want to believe, I'm just not sure. Well... Progressively, he still works with you. But if you say, ah, I don't need this, 
then you start forming the scar tissue. All right. Now, uh, we're in the book of Ephesians. Under the doctrine of total depravity, we are guaranteed that there is no such thing as creature knowledge or genius that has ever entered in to any, anything pertaining to spiritual enlightenment. Now, there are four Ds. I guess you could call this 3D. The natural man is dead. Ephesians 2.1. And you hath he made alive, where? Spiritually. They were already alive physically, soulishly, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5, even when we were dead. Now, the word dead there, necros, is opposed to thanatos. Thanatos means spirit, spiritually dead. But the use of necros indicates that there was no fullness it, it is a body, it is a corpse. There is no force and there's no function. So, this little instrument here that goes on into the human spirit is absolutely lifeless. It cannot perform, it cannot understand, it cannot comprehend. It is absolutely, positively dead. Now we're gonna see what the Holy Spirit does to this in just a little bit, but uh, before we uh, do that, there is another word that we must see. John, uh, chapter 3. Well, let's go to John 1. That'll be the same, same word in John 1. All things were made by him, verse 3. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. But the light shone in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Go to chapter 3, verse 19. This is the condemnation that light, common grace, is come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, okay? The chamber of the human spirit is dark, and it's the word scotia, and it means absolutely no light. It comprehended it not. It could not grasp it. It could not reflect it. it, it, it uh, the light shone in there and uh, uh, simply said, we don't want any part of it. Now, there's... One more word that we want to write over the heart here, and that is the word deceitful. And we're in the book uh, of John. We, got, we have to go back to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, and then we'll go to a word in the Old Testament. All right, Ephesians 4, 22. Put off the old man, the former conversation, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Now, this is why, verse 17, other Gentiles walk in the emptiness of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Creature genius does not count in any way, shape, or form. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God because of ignorance and the blindness of their heart. So, therefore, the heart is deceitful. It means, apate, they make false statements for false impressions. Get it down to modern-day vernacular, they kid themselves. Uh, somebody told you, you need Christ as Savior, and you say, I don't need to be saved. What is that? That's, that's deceit. You're just kidding yourself. Oh, uh, I don't need to go to church. I don't need doctrine. I don't need that nonsense the pastor teaches and harps on. I don't need that stuff. You're just kidding yourself. Why? Uh, because the heart's deceitful. It gives you false statements of false impressions about yourself. You're arrogant. You're proud. You don't need God's grace. And that's exactly what the heart does to you. 
Why? Because you cannot perceive spiritually, you're dead, your chamber is dark uh, for a spiritual phenomenon, your heart is deceitful, the old sin nature keeps refluxing back and it puts an image there of yourself that you're better than the cross and the system of God. And so you fail every time. You keep making false statements. To whom? Well, others, but you mainly make it to yourself. You're just kidding yourself. Now, I, I like Jeremiah 17. Let's turn back there. Jeremiah chapter 17. And verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, the word there, deceitful, is akob. A-Q-O-B. And I like this because it, uh, it means to really snare and catch yourself. To catch in a snare of what's called a foot track trap. Where you have in your stream of consciousness here. Now, even though you're unsaved, you still have a stream of consciousness. And it goes around this direction. Now, here you are volitionally. And... You see some tracks. Now, we'll call these the tracks of the old man. You see, we've gone this route before. Who went before me? Who went before you? Adam. His tracks are in your soul. Now, you come up here and uh, the Holy Spirit tells you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Reject what Adam did. Trust in the second Adam or the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And you immediately, rather than following him and believing him, you see the tracks that go around this way. All right? So you begin to go to uh, the, uh, or follow the path of the same direction. The only thing is this. It means to set a trap. It's an old Indian trick where you're going this way, and all of a sudden you brush away your, your moccasin prints, and you have another trail this way, and uh, you hit, you, you're distracting them from the main goal, the, the fort, fortress here. And as they, they follow the tracks here, you hide in uh, the bushes. The bushes are the old sin nature. And here's where Adam hides. He walks and leaves his tracks here, and uh, he hides then in the old sin nature. There's, a, there's an imagination here, an evil one, and he's hiding behind it. And you have followed these, and all of a sudden you turn to follow those tracks, and what happens? It means that from beneath the bush, he grabs you by the heel and he topples you. He turns you upside down. Now, that's exactly what happens to you. Every time you follow the tracks of the old man or Adam into sin, you're simply deceiving yourself. He catches you and he means uh, you because you're in Adam. You're committing the exact same thing. So... You're caught in a foot track trap. This is where Adam went before, you follow him, and the old man catches you by the heel and topples you. He makes you fall. What did Adam do? He made you fall. What do you do when you don't follow doctrine? You fall into sin. All right, now, we're going to come then to the matter of common grace. What does common grace teach us? It teaches us that from the time we're about three years of age until the time we're 12 years of age, we're brought to God consciousness. That from the time of 12 years of age until the time we either believe or harden our hearts, God the Holy Spirit does something. What does he do? He becomes a human spirit, but there's more to common grace than that. Here's what we'll, uh, um, uh, here's the three points under which we will consider common grace. Common grace means that he gives you E1. E1 is directly related to the old sin nature as it pertains to the volition. Now, we talk about free will. Actually, after Adam sinned, there was no such thing as total free will because we are under the tyranny of the old sin nature. 
Romans chapter 6 says, everything we do, we yield our instruments, sin unto sin, wickedness unto wickedness. Oh, but you know some, I know some really nice religious people. I don't care. They are under the bondage of the sin nature. They're following, they're deceiving themselves by following the footsteps of the old Adam, and he trips them up every time. He, he simply says from under the bush, bushes, gotcha. Got you that time. What well, you didn't believe in Christ. I got gotcha. you. I didn't believe either. So you, you actually are tricking yourself. Instead of knowing your bearings, understanding your direction, heading toward the objective, you say, here are some tracks to lead off this way. I'll just follow them. And you follow the old Adam, and the old Adam catches you and, and makes you captive to him. So enablement says that at certain points in your life, temporarily, God the Holy Spirit frees you from the old sin nature. You're not saved, but in order for you to be saved, you have to have your volition extricated from the bonds of that nature, or you'll never believe. That's what common grace says. That's the part of the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the next thing he does is in the realm of your human spirit. What does he do? He becomes a human spirit for you. He, he allows this instrument, which was dead, to live temporarily. He allows this chamber, which was totally dark, to see the light temporarily. It just, just enough so that you will see. It's called being perspicuous. He makes Bible phenomenon perspicuous. In what area? In the area of the gospel. You don't need to learn, as we will today, post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. All you need to know to get saved is, I'm a sinner and Jesus is the Savior. Believe and you're saved. And that's what he shows you. So he gives enablement. By the way, the natural man receiveth not the things of the, the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. That just simply means in and of himself. If, if the Holy Spirit did not come in and grab a hold of this guy, he would never in his natural state comprehend it. So that's the second thing that he does. He gives the ability to perceive. Now, the third thing is encouragement. E2 is the direct ministry of the, or excuse me, yeah, uh, E3 is the direct ministry of the Holy Spirit to the soul. This is where he says to you, believe in Christ. And you say, yes, I'd like to believe. And then God the Holy Spirit leads somebody who is also spirit-filled, who is a soul winner to that person, and you open the Bible and that person trusts in Christ. That's common grace. Now you will see that there is a cross work here. Because I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But he hath revealed them unto us, how? By his spirit, not creature genius, by his spirit he revealed them. There is a common ground or common grace. All right, then what happens? Well, after you believe, the Holy Spirit begets a human spirit. But the pattern is the same for learning. Do you see it? The pattern is the same. That's efficacious grace. It means that God the Holy Spirit actually does give you a human spirit, and he no longer has to do that, but he has to minister to that spirit by deadening the old sin nature. See, this chamber was dead at first, then he makes this chamber dead. Uh, this chamber was dark, uh, then he makes this chamber dark. He makes this one alive and this one full of light. This one was deceitful, but for the first time in your life, God the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of your shoulders, he gives your head a nod, and he said, will you please wake up? Will you please? And he shakes you. You're deceiving yourself. Come on, you're smarter than that. Believe in Christ. And that's exactly what he does. But again, most folks just simply reject that. But the same thing is true for learning, where spiritual phenomenon is the total ministry of God the Holy Spirit based on one thing and one thing only, volition. He gives the, the 
comprehension for Bible knowledge. He gives it and he does alone. All right, now we're uh, going to look at a pattern here. Why this is important, we're not, we're just going to mention them and then we'll begin in the after service to, to look at their importance. We've talked about the three R's. Actually, there are five. And these five R's are really important to your life. Now, five is the number of grace. And uh, we have five, the number of the grace apparatus of perception, preservation, and production. Now, it, it is my suggestion as, um, as a pastor that you learn these five R words. See, we're, we even keep it clean. We make R words. We don't have any other type of words. And we have big words. We don't, we don't, we don't submit ourselves to the four letter things. But this is the pattern for your Christian life. Whether you know it or not, this is the path. You'll never live the Christian life apart from these five things. Never do it. You will never learn. You will never comprehend. You will never master. You will never defeat the enemy. You will never do it. Never. Uh, what are they? First of all, reception. Now you'll note that I have the Greek word gnosis here. Gnosis is strictly academic knowledge. If somebody goes to church and they read a portion of scripture and they memorize a verse, or they've read like the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> that's uh, all some churches do is get up Sunday morning and collectively they read the Lord's Prayer. So they read the Lord's Prayer and uh, they can re recite this. Yes, but it's simply gnosis doctrine. If they do not have pneumaticos, if they do not have epinosis, then the gnosis doctrine, which is strictly academic understanding, creature genius, goes through the realm of the conscience into the realm of the heart, and you'll remember this is the mind here, and this is technically the heart, though the whole heart sometimes is used for the total faculties of the soul. Gnosis just simply is transferred over into the heart and you have simply a creature or a secular frame of reference for biblical understanding. And that's why there are 7,205,170,000 uh, uh, different types of interpretations and religions. Because man is coming to the Bible with creature genius and saying, this, this is it. Nonsense. It's gnosis. Yeah, it's Bible, but it's gnosis being transferred over here to, to the heart. It does not become epinosis. It's simply academic understanding. That's why, that's why Jimmy Cotta will, will, will say, blessed are the peacemakers. And he'll go around the world trying to bring in peace to our planet. And yet Jesus said, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars until I come and establish peace as the Prince of Peace. Does Jimmy Carter know the Bible? Well, he knows that verse of Gnosis here. Does he understand the Bible? If you say yes, you're <laughs> no, number three in total depravity. You're kidding yourself. Come on. There's not, not going to be any peace till Jesus Christ comes back and whacks the tar out of Gentile nations that are so arrogant they think they can demote the Jews. Does he, does he understand uh, uh, a Bible principle, the blessed are the peacemakers? Well, yeah, he understands, but can he comprehend the totality of it? He cannot. Why? Because he, his is basically a works type of, of approach to Christianity. And um, it's not non-dispensational, it's non-fundamental. And so therefore, he has gnosis doctrine only. Secular Bible knowledge. Who would know the Bible more than the Pope? Is Pope saved? You've got to be kidding. Secondly, it's retention. And the, set, and the word here is pneumaticos, spiritual phenomenon. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual, things of the spirit with spiritual phenomenon. How do you compare? How do you understand? It's totally by the work of the Holy Spirit. 
and not man's genius. The Holy Spirit takes gnosis, and you say to the Holy Spirit, I've heard the word, and I believe it. And God, the Holy Spirit, performs a miracle. Now, here, here's a, something. We've only got a few minutes, and so I'm just going to make uh, this remark regarding uh, th this drawing, the retention of, of Bible doctrine. Uh, we've, we make a lot today about there are, there are no miracles going on in the dispensation of grace. And uh, so I've started adding the word overt miracles. Uh, nobody has the gift of healing and that sort of thing. We're all aging and so forth. But is there a miracle going on? Oh, yeah. Your salvation is a miracle. Don't let anybody kid you. But it was the Holy Spirit and God did everything for you and came to the point of, understand, of your understanding so that no matter where you are, in, in creature genius, you are brought to a common point of understanding here. And the only thing you can add to it is, even the Holy Spirit brought you the understanding. The only thing you can do is bow your head in humble belief and say, God, I believe it. You heard the word today. And you bow to the Holy Spirit and you say, God, I believe it. And the Holy Spirit does something to Gnosis. It's a miracle. He transforms it to pneumaticos, spiritual phenomenon. Where's the only place in your body that spiritual phenomenon is perceived and understood in the realm of the Spirit? It's totally His ministry and work on your behalf. That's why we call it a grace apparatus. What is grace? God doing something for you that you cannot do for yourself. There is nothing you can add to grace to make to to boast that you have something that God could not give you. That's nonsense. All right. We uh, have three more R's and a long way to go to understand how we understand. <laughs>